Welcome to the ODD Collective Radio Show, and where the agendas are only to tell our stories our way. Where an eclectic group of hosts deliver a different show every Sunday. The show is produced by Ever Beyond Radio and broadcasted over Wolf Spirit Radio Network. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Our Worlds. Nancy is not with us. <laughs> Nancy okay. is not able to be with us just now. Um, hang on. Uh, uh, can I call her landline? Wal- Walt and Nancy are having a remote control crisis with each other across sta- various states of the United States. <laughs> So they're in a bit of a united state, if you like. So over there, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to Wolf Spirit Radio and uh, into the ODD collective space. Um, you seem to be, um, uh, you have your own, <laughs> you're on your own, <laughs> it looks like, <laughs> because Nancy's okay. unable to okay. join us. But um, uh, why don't you just um, introduce yourself and we'll see what we can do. With the, uh, with, with the Nancy situation, but I, I, I'd love to hear who you are, what you are, where you come from, and why you're so ODD. Okay, you got it. Okay, let me start talking here. Hello, everybody. Yeah, hello. Uh, you also need to get a bit closer to your Wi-Fi. You're a bit crackly on the, on the, on the call there. Oh, I see. Go closer to the Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> closer to the Wi-Fi. That sounds a bit better. Give me a five. <laughs> okay, Neil, try again. Go ahead. Okay. Um, um, thing with the Wi-Fi is I can't really get closer to it because it's another room. So. <laughs> okay, just don't move. <laughs> okay. <Just> All, right. <laughs> All right then. So, uh, please go ahead and, uh, yeah, uh, wh- what makes you so ODD? Yes. Uh, okay. Very good. Um, should I just say hello to everybody first? Yes, and, indeed. Uh, I mean, okay. There you are. Yeah, because, uh, all right. I'm in the chat room also. So hello everyone. Uh, my guest, Nancy Hopkins, is having some technical difficulties getting on right now and our good host JP is working on it um, so in the meantime I'll let me introduce myself um, I'm Neil Akash from Bangladesh I, I live in Dhaka city the capital of Bangladesh and I have I got introduced to Nancy through my good friend Renee Jett uh, she's not here with us tonight um, so uh, basically, we were we got introduced over Facebook. Uh, this group uh, called Bill uh, Brownbrader, the person who is a super soldier, who uh, was kind of pretty well known in the alternative media for a while back in I think 2011-12. So that's when things got started for some of us. For me, I think I started becoming more ODD than I was from birth uh, back in um, 2008, 9, some, some there. And what I don't, I'm not sure. Basically, uh, from very child, from the very childhood, I would be a little bit, uh, how do you, how should I say it? On the ODD side, uh, in terms of Socializing and uh, getting uh, because I'm I'm a, I'm from a Muslim family. My uh, my family background is kind of religious. My father's side is quite uh, serious about religion and stuff like that. My mom's side is not so much. So anyway, um, um, so back in eight, 1989, I was uh, doing my I started my college degree in Dhaka, uh, in engineering. Actually, it was architecture. And then I uh, 
I went to went over to New York, New York City as an immigration as an immigrant through my father who who went through my uncle who married an American girl. Uh, so that's how we got our green card from here to the United States. And then I studied in City College of New York and got my degree in computer science. And then started working there with uh, AT&T. I worked for IBM. These are all IT companies. Uh, JP Morgan, I was there as this programmer analyst. And then something happened, and I quit that job, and I came back to Dhaka, and I never left. I never went back. So um, that's my story there. And then ever since I've been in Dhaka, my consciousness started to grow in some in some manner, which I didn't quite understand back then, that I understand now. Um, so basically, I I was working as an IT personnel here as well. I was doing support. I was actually a system manager at a private university called North South University, and then I got fired for. Various reasons, and I don't want to get into those things. After this, something happened, and I, 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 de- I decided not to work. So, but there are things that have been going on with my life which I can't really put my finger on, or can't really get into a discussion about. This, this has to do with, uh, I guess, uh, my consciousness being, you know being bumped around and opening up to new ideas and stuff like that. I don't really know because this is kind of, I've, uh, looking back, I feel now that I, I have been guided in some way, in some divine manner, if you, for lack of a better word, uh, which I cannot quite uh, logically explain. So, um, JP, are you there? But I'm sorry, I just want to make sure that um, people can hear me and everything's okay. Yes, very well. Keep going. Okay, okay, all right. You're, you're still working on a Nancy issue, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, after I, uh, my, I got fired from my job, I, I was staying home, and I started spending a whole lot of time on the Internet. And that's when I, I think I got somebody on the line. Okay, never mind. Okay. So, um, essentially, I started learning about the, the alternative version of reality, kind of like waking up in the Matrix, like the movie Matrix. Even though when I saw the movie, I didn't quite understand what that was all about, the red pill and the blue pill. And Neo waking up inside of the Matrix. I loved the movie, but I didn't quite understand what this was all about. Right? So, so essentially, what happened is I started watching a whole lot of videos on my cell phone back then from Project Camelot with Carrie Cassidy and Bill Ryan. And that's when that's when I started learning things that I never knew about about things such as the American underground intelligence, the United States military, particularly Navy, and what's going on with the black projects and with the super soldiers uh, with uh, stuff that is discussed by Miles Johnston in his basis basis projects. And also back then there was also the Amash project with Johan Summerscales and these guys were working together and interviewing people and getting information out that cannot be really proven by any kind of known methods. So this was kind of airy fairy and people didn't believe these things. But for some odd reason, I really resonated with these informations and I just kept getting more and more interested and I never lost that interest and I, I started following everything that was coming out. I started uh, 
reading channel messages, Arcturian messages and uh, Salusa, Syrian messages, Sheldon Nidal, and everything, you know, none of these things I have been studying before. I never knew these things existed. I didn't know what channeling was. I didn't know about the law of one by uh, Mr. Uh, Casey, Edgar Casey. So uh, all of these informations started downloading, being, I, I don't know how to explain it. I kept studying these things and I wasn't really sure what made me tick with these things so strongly. And, and then gradually after, after initially I started with the, with the videos from Carrie Cassidy and Miles Johnston. And then I was reading a lot of blogs and with the blogs, I started quickly when I tried to explain to people what I was learning through Facebook or in person. I started experiencing some kind of resistance from people and I couldn't explain to them that this was, these things were really true. So, uh, I realized that, that if just following the blogs and listening to a few videos is not going to get me too far. So I started reading books. And for this, I started downloading PDFs, and there are lots, there are lots of PDFs available on the internet for free. If you just, you know, look, if you look hard enough, you can find, uh, good books on just about any subject. So, I started reading books, and that's when I went to the, went to the next level, that I started developing a kind of confidence in this, in the subject that I was studying. Hello, somebody? Yep, that was Nancy just discreetly snapping her fingers to show her microphone is working. Excellent, is Nancy? Nancy, you here? I am. Um, let me hang up from Walt. Walt, I'm going to hang up on you. I, they again, they, you, again, you're hanging up on Walt. You, well, you do you, it all the time. You, I know. Bless can you me. guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're coming in. You're fine. Well done, okay, Walt. No, no echoes, no problems. No, no, perfect. Everything's good. Everything's okay, well, good. everything is good. JP well says done, so, so Walt. got the blessing. Yeah, I just, I just, I just sent him well done on his guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Oh, God bless this man. I don't know what I would do without him. I'm so sorry for this. Um, I, I, I knew Your Neil would be in good Jesus. hands with you. Yes. <laughs> I knew, I knew he'd be in good hands with you, but, um, uh, as long as we're good, keep going, Neil. I'm right here when, when you okay. get ready. Ask me a question, I'll be here maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. You're my guest tonight, so you'll be doing the talking for the most part. So I'm just going to finish up with what I was saying, and then you're up. Okay? Yep, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. All righty. So as I was saying, um, so uh, I got from... Educating myself with blogs, I started delving into books, and that's when my level of education started going up, and my confidence level started going up, and I started understanding things a little bit more clearly, and more importantly, I started to connect the dots, and a, a clearer picture, larger picture of what was going on in our reality started to emerge. So then, and then I learned a lot of things about the Jesuits, the Rothschilds, the Illuminati, the Freemasons. I started reading these these guys, uh, material on these people, the secret societies, and started seeing the picture, right? And then there was also the ET version of my knowledge, ET, uh, ET faculty that I was, I was getting into because uh, from bases and my, uh, Carrie Cassidy's videos, those guys are constantly talking about different uh, extraterrestri extraterrestrial experiences uh, in the military and intelligence communities. So gradually I started believing that, you know, this ET thing is actually real. It has to be. Because otherwise, how can so many people from so different angles, so different countries... Right, telling about their experiences. So there's no way that all of these guys are in cahoots with some kind of a huge 
fake psyops that they're trying to fool us with. It just didn't make sense. So then, well, anyway, so I had my doubts about you know, the existence of extraterrestrials and their, they, the negatives, the regressives controlling us, the whole planet. Initially, it didn't, you know, it sounded like a big giant lie, but, but anyway, gradually, um, what happened is I started this, this I kind of did on my own that I started no, kind of intuitively realizing that there is a connection between the Freemasons and the reptilian regressives. But I didn't find any books that would explain this. Okay. So I started trying to uh, connect this dot, if, see if it's true. So I listened to um, this man named J.J. Uh, Hortak or Hortak. I think he's a great guy and also some uh um is a russian not exactly russian but uh this scientist who sounds like russian but he's not exactly russian i forget his name right now but anyway so so what started happening is that i started seeing a connection between the inner circle of the freemason um okay with the regressive reptilians and the Draco overlords and the archontic, archonic, uh, domination or hegemony on this planet. So, and then everything started to fit together. And my, my hypothesis regarding the reptilian control of this planet, my own personal idea about it. Other people were talking about it, but I wanted to have my own idea. I wanted to. I didn't want to believe anybody else. So I, I took up, I collected a little piece of information from all different sources. For example, there was this person named Dolores Cannon. Most, a lot of people are familiar with her work. So she came as a special person in my, in my knowledge because she was, she wasn't a, you know, typical a military person or anything. She was a hypnotist. Regress, uh, regression hypnotist. So this sounded to me like, wait a minute, she's coming from another angle, and she's talking about through her hypno, uh, through her hypnotic experiences with thousands of um, clients. She started learning about the ETs because she was communicating with ETs through her clients. And however, she was also working with CIA, so her clients were mostly brought to her by CIA as well. So there is a CIA connection there, but even even so, I still thought that, you know, this is a very unique uh, perspective that I'm getting here on the ETs. And she has, she, she also had a whole bunch of information that she wrote books on. I think she wrote about 10 books or something. The, and as she was getting older, she was actually getting more and more uh, uh, eloquent with her speech and writing books. And she's getting, she was getting more energetic, which was amazing to see because it's, you could clearly see that something strange is going on here. In the, initially, I could barely follow what she was saying because she wouldn't she wouldn't speak clearly. But that would change towards uh, towards the end and. A couple of years later, she would be giving lectures all over the place, and she was very clear. So those things. So there were subtle hints of paranormal things going on around me all the time. I could see it with my life as well, uh, being totally focused on the exopolitics issue here on this planet. And so, and my being in Bangladesh is also kind of critical because here, I don't, I didn't have one single person to discuss these things with. Anybody I tried to talk to would be like, come on man, you lost it. You need a break. You gotta take a break. You gotta see a psychiatrist. Something's not right with you. So something's wrong. You better, you better check it out and take care of yourself. That's the only thing I, I would be suggested at that time. But I knew I wasn't losing it. I knew I was saying, you know, so I was, I would, I used to get upset with people and I stopped talking to, talking to them or lose contact and 
wouldn't you know get in touch with them. But I guess I'm getting kind of boring right now. So what I'm gonna do is switch over to Nancy. Nancy, you there? I am. I am here. Okay, so so boring. So, I was yeah, listening. Uh, okay. So basically, that's how my knowledge on the subject of exit politics came about. Okay. So, but I, I tell this to my to my friends and people on Facebook who I communicate with. However, they are not convinced that usually they very very few people get actually convinced that the knowledge that I gather over the internet and reading books, few books. They don't think it's sound enough. So whatever hypothesis I have regarding the ETs and the and other stuff, banking and the Rothschilds and whatever. So none of this is really sane and sound and dependable to most people here. Okay, they want to see proof. They will tell me that okay, if you say reptilians exist, can, can you show me a picture? So, and I can't, right? So. That's a problem. They're like, look, you, you've never seen an, in a, you've never seen a reptilian. There's no picture. You've never seen a video. There's no fossil. There's no bones or anything. So how do you, how is it that you still, excuse me, still believe that reptilians exist? What's your proof? And so I want to forward this question to Nancy. Do you have any kind of proof of extraterrestrials, Nancy, through your life or any other way? Would you take this Yeah, question? well, um, you know, that's a tricky question because for me, I've had experiences of direct contact with them. Yeah, I want to hear about this, please. Um, okay, let me let me just back up one, one minute here because I think that with the story you've been telling... Uh -huh. is your story, your path as to how you've been led to an awakening. Yes. And I'm quite a bit older than you, probably twice as old. I don't know how old <laughs> you are. Not that much but, older than this. It's okay. I'm old too, man. <laughs> <laughs> but what but happens anyway. when, you, when, you, when you get older, you begin to see these, you see your life in a, in a bigger perspective. And so right. while you're living and you're younger, you don't realize that you're being led actually uh -huh. kind of led down a path. Exactly. And as you I get older, way. yeah, and as you get older, you all of a sudden see how all these seemingly diverse episodes were actually like almost like somebody had a, an imprint on it. You know, it's like, uh -huh. no, somebody was causing me. I mean, to give you an example, when I was doing research in the Kennedy assassination, I was looking at Lee Harvey Oswald. And I wanted to um, learn more, so I was um, I looked at a bibliography, and there was a book um, on, on Oswald. And so I thought, well, you know, that sounds like the book I want to I want to read. So I go right. to my um, bookstore, and I said to them, you know, can you get me this book? And they said, oh, it's out of print. It 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 will be very expensive. And I I didn't have money at the time, so I said, okay, okay. Now I left the bookstore, and I went to a um, like a Walmart type of thing, you know, one of these big super duper stores getting something else. And as I'm walking to do what I'm doing, all of a sudden I, there was a whole bunch of books. I mean, like a stack of used bo uh, you know, cheap books. And I went, right. no, this cannot be possible. I didn't spend more than two minutes before I found that very book. And that's in, in, in hundreds of books. They were just thrown wow. in a, you know, they were just thrown in piles. And right. I, I picked it up and I went, oh my God, I just, you know, I mean, I, I can remember still, you know, I've got it in my hand and I'm walking away and I'm going like, this couldn't have happened. Right. And if I did not have that book, if I had never met that book, I would right. not have had the key to unlocking the true secrets behind the Kennedy assassination. So right. that is how powerful I see the guides. Okay. Exactly. Guides. You're right. You know, down, down to information. As regarding the, um, the, uh, ET situation, now that's, that's an odd one too, because I was a freshman in high school. The teacher was teaching debate. Um, one of my classmates, um, 
he said, why don't we debate about flying saucers? Now, this is back in 1964, probably, too, okay. probably. So there was not a tremendous amount of knowledge or information. I had never even thought about it. And so um, I had a crush on him. So I, I said, oh, you know, he, she, the teacher said, well, you're going to be one of the debaters if you want to debate about that. And she said, what, what do you want to debate? He said, well, I want to debate they don't exist. And so then she, uh, you know, who will debate that they do? And I put my hand up because I had a crush on him. So um, then I started to research it, and I was absolutely stunned because there was so much information if you went to the library. And... Wow. It was really shocking to me how many, I mean, compared to what we got now, no. But at that time, I mean, right in the library, there were three books about it. And because mm-hmm. I had a really good library system, um, I was able to go to a to the bigger city library and get magazine articles and things like this, you know. And so when I presented the first, you know, the opening statement about the ETs, um, the uh, unidentified flying objects. Well, the kid wouldn't even debate me. He said, I, I, "He says I believe her," <laughs> and I uh-huh. didn't even debate it, you know, because there was so many stories. Um, right. That's what what people miss is that in the beginning it wasn't like yeah. somebody's. It was stories that you right. you know going like all these people cannot be telling the same crazy story, so. I was prepared mentally um, as a young person, uh, you know, freshman age in high school, to um, accept the possibility that there were these ETs or these UFOs. But I really said to myself, well, I ain't going to believe it until I actually see it. And then right. I then I st- started seeing the lights, you know. There's and this was this was gradual. It was like years later, you know. You go, why okay. is there why is there this red light and why is it doing that? That shouldn't be there, you know. Just right. nothing you can put your hands on or anything. And then I go to um, the University of Massachusetts, and it, I was a freshman there, and there were two girls. Now, oddly enough, we were all named Nancys. Okay, so you have Big Nancy, Little Nancy, and then me. I was just Nancy. <laughs> and I start, I, uh, people love to hear the stories, and I love to tell stories. So I would, I just start telling ET stories, you know, the ones I had read when, when I studied it. And, right. um, what happened was that it was two o'clock in the morning, because in college you stay up late studying, and, I walked by their room and they were still up and I said, okay guys, I'm, I'm, I'm off to bed, sleep well. And all of a sudden, Big Nancy, who was in her bunk bed, little Nancy wasn't, but Big Nancy was, and she says, you guys aren't gonna believe this, but there's a UFO right outside the window. Well, of course we didn't believe it. We had just been talking about it, right? Right. So we go over to the window, I pull, pull back the drapes, and then every, obscene word I knew in my life started coming out of my mouth because I was looking at a very classic UFO, a saucer shaped thing. And in I gotta tell you what the 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 because this becomes weird a weird situation in that at the University of Massachusetts it was a dormitory residential area. So you had these um smaller buildings that were three stories high. And then you had one, two, three. At that time, there was only three towers that were 21 stories high. And okay. right across from the building that I'm in was the dining facility. Now, I was on the second floor, and the dining facility was probably, oh, what's the easiest way to think about it? Probably about two-thirds of a football field, because football fields seem to be this measurement of unity. You know, everybody knows what that is. So it wasn't, it wasn't that far away, you know. And, um, this UFO is flying towards us very slowly, moving slowly towards us. And it is circular, you know, and it's got this red light uh-huh. spinning around the outside of it. Uh, wow. just going to the peripheral like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. And, you know, it gets to the, and I mean, I, it could have flown right into the window. I never would have stopped swearing. And of course, you know, the others wow. now 
multiply saying, holy my God, this is real. And the thing got to the, to about the, the, uh, the right, so that it was right over the dining facility that was about a five story building. And all of a sudden it just went, whoosh, gone. Wow. You know? Nancy, let me ask you something. Now that you know a whole lot more, who are these guys? Do you have any idea? Well, see, now that's where it becomes problematic because yeah, I thought they were outer space people. I mean, who else was behind all this? It was the stories that I'd heard coming to life. But you flash uh-huh. forward 50 years and you find out that there's a secret space program. Right. Uh, and that many of the things that we think we see that are uh, extraterrestrial are actually domestic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Local and, products. And in that time frame, it's conceivable it was. Uh, one of the U.S. or one of the, you know, the world instead of being extraterrestrial. But it, uh-huh. from, from my, my own personal what happened after that, um, I can't believe that I would be targeted so many times to see similar events if it wasn't something that was much beyond 3D people trying to fly saucers around the earth. Right. So I felt that it was ET at the time. And the other weird thing about it was that when about uh, I, I thought it was within three weeks of this, I was again up late in the you know it's probably about midnight I guess, and I'm in the dormitory studying when all of a sudden I got this really strange feeling, and um, my roommate was next to me and I said I've got this really weird feeling about you know and she says what do you mean I said. I don't know, but it seems like I felt it before. And then all of a sudden I remembered that I had felt that same way as I was walking down the hall and passing their Nancy and Nancy's room just before I saw that UFO. And all of a sudden when I made that connection, I just jumped up and I ran downstairs and I ran outside and I knew exactly where to look in the sky to see the same thing. Now she followed me down. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Well, there's a lot of interesting things about it. She follows me down, and she sees it. And I said, why would I know it's here? And she says, I don't know. You know, I I don't know. But we had been working on telepathy. We had been practicing Uh telepathy. And she said to me, just relax and see if you can telepathically connect. So I did. I Okay, all right, all right. (laughs) You know, and then I was like, Go to go to my right. Go to my left. Go up. Go down. They took all of the directions. Wow. Now, she remembers us outside doing this. I remember it, but neither of us remembered going back into the building. Uh huh. And so we you never have lost time there, probably. And we never talked about it. And I didn't realize this until years later. Um, after that, we had um, a. Another occasion where we were walking across the field at the university, going to a movie with two other people. Oh no, there was no, there was one other person with us, and then there was like four other people in front of us walking, you know, towards the theater. And all of a sudden, I looked at her and I said, "I got that feeling again." And I turned around and looked over my left shoulder, and there it was. Only this thing was really low; it was the size of a house. And it was really low, and it flies over us very, very silently. There wasn't any noise, but it flies over us. And, of course, she's also turned around. And so we're watching this thing, and to see what happened to the people in front of us, the four who were talking and walking, and all of a sudden they've got this circ- you know, saucer-shaped vehicle that's the size of a house flying over them. I mean, stop dead in their tracks. You know, everybody just stopped. And it went, it flew by us about a mile, mile and a half, made a 90 degree turn for about another half a mile, did another 90 degree turn, and then stopped. And when it stopped, it was over a wooded area just outside the town of Amherst. And in the distance, I can see these flickering lights, and I'm going like, they got a jet up there. They see it on radar. They're coming after this sucker. Cause, uh, a military air force was very close by at Westover Air Force Base. And as the thing is sitting there, we can see a round circular, well, a light doing, you know, I know it was one of those little ones, the round circular things, going up into this bigger one. And the the jet, it's almost on top of it when it, it, they just went, boosh, gone. 
Wow. You know? So you've got... Like, tell you, okay. you got seven people that can, you know, confirm that this is exact, because we did stand there and talk about it. Um, okay. You know, that this is what had happened. Then, not very long after this, uh, within three months of this, we were in um, the same dormitory, but on the third floor. we just come back from the dining room, and somebody was looking out the window and went, Starlight, star bright, what, what the hell kind of a star is that? And so I look out the window, and there is a bright light that was like very diamond shape, like a, a like a tall diamond shape thing. And it was just sitting there, very bright, but it didn't seem to have a beam. It was just this bright light. And all of a sudden, it rotated. And so now you can, you're not looking dead into the beam, you're sort of seeing it to the side, but again, I mean, not the beam, but the, the light itself. And again, there was not a beam that you could see. And it was dusk. It was not blackout, it was dusk. And this thing proceeded to fly directly in front of us, and it was 15 stories above us. Now, the reason I know that is because I had a friend who was on the 15th story balcony on one of two towers that faced were, were facing each other. And this thing flew right between them at the 15th floor because she was on the balcony. She said, I could have reached out and touched it. Oh, my God. Wow. All right. Um, uh, now, this one was different. This one was totally different. If I, if I had to suspect, was this E.T. or was this uh, some kind of a, a Terran type of thing, an Earth uh, vehicle, I'm kind of feeling like it might have been an Earth vehicle. Because um, the structure of it was not circular at all. It was um, it, it had almost well. The best way I can explain it is sort of the B two, uh, the B four bomber. Uh, you know that. Okay. The jet, I, I think that, yeah, I know. You know that, that image that of the of the the long fuselage and these wings that are cut. They're thick wings, but they're cut back. There definitely uh-huh. seemed to be a wing thing there. Um, okay. Also. I felt like there was some kind of, um, like, windows. Um, but again, and it was gun, re- gun, gun metal, um, bl- blue black. Uh huh. And not a sound. Now, again, this, when, when, when the human brain sees this type of thing, it is so overpowering that your brain kind of wants to shut down. Right. I thought about gr- grabbing a camera. You know, we didn't have phones that take pictures. Nobody thought about it. You know, we all just stood there and, and looked at it. And we did not talk about it. This is the thing that always gets me, is that sometimes you have these amazing events, and yet the people that were right there, they continually say, but we didn't talk about it. Because you don't know what to say. Your brain doesn't know how to process it. Right. You know, so you... Nancy, how old were you at this time? Um, I would have been um, 19... Nineteen. So, uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about the your interaction with the Galactic Federation. Was this later or earlier? No, that was much later. Much that later. Much later. Okay. How, how much later? Um, well, let me see. That was eighty nine. So this was this was like sixty. Oh. This would have been sixty seven versus eighty nine. Okay, so this is about twenty two years. Did you want to fast forward to the Galactic Federation, or you had more interesting? Well, I just want to say, I just want to say one thing that um, even though we saw no news at the university in Massachusetts, my Mm -hmm. roommate's boyfriend in Buffalo, New York, sent her a um, newspaper clipping that discussed this very thing. That happened at wow. the University of Massachusetts, you know. It was a newspaper okay. article, but not local. That's the other thing that happens, is a lot of times you don't hear it at the local level, what, what some people hear in other places. It's almost like wow. the, they, they control the news in the local area, but, you know, somebody outside of that area not being controlled right. releases it. The control wasn't so strict back then, I guess. It, was, it would leak out somehow. Yeah, you know, it was mostly they're just doing, you know, uh, damage control yeah. in a given small right. area. But that report yeah. said that um, there was no radar detection of that particular vehicle. And the Air Force, because there was a thousand people that reported this. 
So what happened was that the Air Force was asked about it, and the local uh, Springfield uh, Air, uh, Air Force base um, made the official announcement that there was no conventional aircraft in the area at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, it so probably makes sense because these guys are stealth aircrafts, anyways. So they probably wouldn't be on the radar. Correct. Even back then, I I, I would assume. Well, but see, what I'm saying is if, if the Air Force was telling the truth and they didn't get a radar ping on it, they had right. apparently gotten a radar ping on those round ones because I saw oh. a jet plane come in after them. Right. So my suspicion years and years later, decades later, is that we were in fact seeing, the round ones were in fact some kind of extraterrestrial influence. You know, I mean, they were mm-hmm. from outer space. But that right. this one was not. This one was okay. sent in there to try to... I don't know, make another story, um, find out who's there, because we were having all within a matter of four months, we kept seeing these things. I'm only giving you the big ones. You know, we saw other things. There was a lot of activity at the university at that time. So maybe they were doing a show of force. I don't know. But I've always felt that this, that one that, that was the gunmetal blue was something different. Okay. So, um, and, and, you know, I followed the same trail you did. You know, you learn more and more. Betty White, Betty and Barney White were extraordinarily Im- impressive in that right. they discussed an abduction. That was the first time any of us ever thought, could that be possible? Then, um, Bud Hopkins comes out and he starts talking to people and, and writing books about people being abducted. And that was something that, um, I found disturbing in that I really didn't want to know it if it was happening. It just bothered me. I didn't want to think about it. So mm-hmm. I read it. You know, I mean, I know the information, but I did not make that an integral part of my reality. Um, okay. And then I went into the military, and I did a whole bunch of other things. And then in the 1980s, 80, you know, the, the like 87, um, I began to interface with a metaphysical community. Yeah, um, tell me about, tell us about this, please. Well, that, that was another weird thing about what was happening. It's, it's like, um, I talked to some people that were in the mineral business for a long time, and they said that it's a 20-year cycle. All of a sudden, everybody starts collecting minerals and gems, and, and then it, it gets really popular, then it tapers off, and 20 years later, the same thing starts up again. These are people not just in their own lives, but they they were Native Americans I was talking to, and their grandfathers were doing this, and their fathers, and then they were doing it, you know, and they said it's a 20-year cycle. So, um, I, I, that which I found very interesting. So it's, a, it's, it's now be, the beginning of another 20 year cycle. When I talk to them, I start to understand the minerals. And the first metaphysical store opened up in our location. Um, so people were drawn oh. to that location. You know, they, Nancy, they, let me just ask you one quick question. What do you mean by a metaphysical store? Okay, we call them metaphysical stores. Um, metaphysics is the umbrella uh, term that is used for such a variety of different concepts, from acupuncture to the concept of, um, you know, life energy, the chi, whatever names it's given, to okay. um, working with stones because they have uh, energies to them. It's really when you begin to talk energy. You begin right, to okay. into, the, into the metaphysical world. Um, mm-hmm. If you want the definition of metaphysics right now, I say quantum physics. Because okay, quantum cool. physics has come out and proven, or given, let's say, given a scientific validation to, you know, so many of the really critical points of metaphysics. So... Um, but the metaphysical, uh, this, this store was, you know, it sold books, it had gems and minerals, it had uh, saging, all of the, the typical um, modalities of, of energy healing, uh, okay. some way or another, they were, they were touching with. And they also had classes. They'd get people okay. together. So for the first time, 
Well, luckily I had my next door neighbor. We were going through this ourselves. So most people don't even have a next door neighbor that's into the same mindset. But right. they, were, they were being drawn to this store. And so people began to open up and talk about more and more of their experiences. Cool. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, once you get into that kind of, that I got into that kind of environment, um, right. the woman who owned it without a doubt is probably the best psychic I've ever met. Um, well, until I met Jean Rockefeller, but she could look inside a human body or an animal's body and see what was wrong, just like an x-ray machine. Right. And, you know, and she wasn't very much into healing as m- much as diagnostic work. Uh, I think she could heal, but I think she was, um, it wasn't something that at that time was really being pushed, that human energy could heal somebody. Okay. <clears throat> but I mean, is it possible to learn these skills for an average person? These psychic skills? skills? Like reading the, reading the energy body to see where it needs healing or stuff like that. Um, like your, yeah. To be honest, you have to be gifted. Uh, some of okay. it, a lot of things can be, be, be taught, but the ability mm-hmm. of some of these people, and like I say, I've got two of them in my life, uh, Jean Rockefeller now, and this woman whose name was Crystal because her mother was watching a soap opera and one of the characters was Crystal and she ended up having a crystal shop. You talk about, <laughs> You know, the synchronicity, synchronistic things that happen in people's lives, including uh-huh. names, you know? Right. Um, but when you're dealing with those kind of people, uh, I've, I, I've seen only two of them that could do it to this degree, where they okay. actually can look inside your body. Now, I can teach people telepathy. I can teach people how to remote view. Shamanistic okay. travel can be taught. Because it's a mindset. It's where you can put your mind into a certain vibration and then opens up doors. But this ability of certain people, I think it's a gift. I, I just don't think you can teach it. Now, I can I teach, mean, I can teach you how to run energy. Okay? okay? Now, what's running energy? Running energy is just allowing energy to flow through your body into, into somebody else's body. It's again, it's a mindset, it's opening up, it's allowing this to happen. It's almost like allowing your imagination to make it real. Right. The, the problem, the problem that comes up is, not a problem, but the difference that comes up is this ability to actually, I mean, look inside a body. Mm-hmm. To give you an example, Crystal, um, learned that, um, I, a friend of mine was in the hospital, Something went terribly wrong in the in the surgery. I got a hold of Crystal. I said, would you please scan? And she's scanning from where she's at into the hospital. And she comes back and she says, um, this doctor shouldn't have done what he did. Um, he's nicked her intestines because he was going after a tumor. But it wasn't a tumor. It was a scar from a previous operation. And don't you know, I went to the hospital I walked out of the elevator. The doctor was there. He was almost in tears, and he said, I I, I might have killed her. And he told me the whole thing, exactly wow. like she told me down to the millimeters of how long this scar was. You know? So, I mean... So this is no pseudoscience we're talking about. No, no. This is this is... That's why I say it's hard for me to not believe. Right. You know? See, people, people around here, this is not very popular. So, a lot of people think that this is just, you know, you know, just uh, fraud stuff, pseudoscience and, you know, people just trying to make money by exploiting people and stuff like that. That's how the general consensus is like that. Well, that, that, there are people out there that want to make money at this, you know? Um, right. There's no doubt about it. I would never make an argument that that's not true. But the the problem is is that people don't study it. If you don't study it, then you don't know right. it. Right. Exactly. If but you then study it's... it and you see the amount of information and proof that's there, then you have yeah. to believe it if you're a sane person. Right. It's the same thing with the extraterrestrials as well. 
because people don't study and they just make the assumption it's not real and they don't want to move from their position. Well, if they if they move to the position that there were ETs, mm -hmm. their entire reality would shift. <laughs> it would it would yes. it would just blow up in front of them. Right. You know right. That's, that's why when that's a catch. yeah when people talk about um, the disclosure, okay that that yes uh -huh. everybody knows about it, but now there's going to be uh, 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 an open you know yes we 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 are in contact with ETs. That's why they they are so hesitant to do it because I don't see I I happen to do, I can argue against this particular argument but their argument is that people will go into a complete social meltdown if you tell them this right and it's conceivable that the ET movies the you know the all the all the different space movies Star Trek Star Wars All of this was is is being used to program people, to program their imagination, to imagine that this is possible. But I don't think right. the dark side is doing that. You know, again, I think it's, it's I think that we are guided by um, spiritual beings. Uh, again, that's another thing that people can't quite grasp. You know, what are you talking about, your guardian angel? <laughs> exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah, let's talk about these things a little bit more. Because uh, there's negative perception about these ideas. Again, it it disrupts their. Okay, you, when you when you've got a certain perception of reality, your uh -huh. worth, your worth, your personal worth, who you think you are, where you hold yourself in esteem, is very dependent on that reality. So if that reality suddenly says, oh, you fool, you've been working at a bank for all this time, aren't you a silly person? You know, all of a sudden, it's like a crushing blow because they're not who they thought they were. And not only that, but they were stupid. They didn't see it. They right. were left behind. That, that to me is the, is the difference is that, um, they, some people will fight in order to maintain this sense of worth. And the sense of worth is based on the reality. That's what I see happening to a lot of people who have been in this business for a very long time. I'm talking right. the arena of conspiracy. Is that they get caught in stories. And yes. the one thing, one thing I have learned is that there is no one story. And every story changes if it is alive. If it gets frozen in the minds of whoever's ta ta living the story, it's going to be lost. It's going to fizzle out. Because you have to nurture these stories with energy of thought. And a lot of these people out there, they don't want to make certain changes, even though they're conspiracy persons, even though they're truthers. You know, most of them depend on the 3D world continuing to, uh, to exist as it is yes and all they want to do is increase their inventory of information that's all just i know five more things now and everything remains the same did you notice this thing well i just i just i just call it getting locked in a story you know you can't right. it, oh, let me let me give you an example um The, the flat earthers. Okay. Uh -huh. Everybody, all of a sudden everybody, every, you know the flat earth story. You know, they, they, oh, yeah. they started talking about this flat earth story. And, I mean, I, the, the, I looked at it and I went, this is absolutely insane. From, from a scientist standpoint, it doesn't answer all sorts of scientific questions. So you're going to throw out science because you got this weird thought? And it didn't uh -huh. make any sense. But what I was was confronting was people who were like brainwashed, like, no, this is the truth. You gotta listen to me. You gotta listen to me. It's the truth. Like this. Right. You know, going mm -hmm. like, why are you coming off like this? Exactly. You know? That dogmatic attitude. This is it, man. You've got to believe it. And it's the only story. Yeah, it's the only story. 
Okay. I, even if it's true, I cannot. I can't go with that. Even if it's true, you know what I mean? Because well, I don't what really know. No, no. This this gets really interesting because right again, I'm I'm I'm, I'm I feel like I'm being guided. Okay. And uh-huh. so what happens is that um, I mean I, I really lost a very good friend over this subject. You know, because I said mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I can't. I can't agree with it. And that was enough to end a, a good friendship. That doesn't make any sense to me. So right. I just kind of put it off to the side. You know, I didn't get upset about him going like, that's an interesting situation. And then right after that, I start to um, research Bigfoot and ended up in the inner earth. All right. Uh-huh. Okay. So now I'm 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 like, what's this? And my God, is there never an end to, to, to these things? You know, <laughs> you, think, yeah. you think you've heard it all, and then you hear ten more stories that you couldn't have even imagined. So now I'm yeah. into the inner earth, and the more I look at the inner earth thing, um, I'm feeling a real resonance with it. You know, it's not only making sense to me, but I'm feeling this draw to it, like this is the truth. This is the truth. Uh-huh. There is a it's, again, you're being guided towards it. From yes, my own we... Yeah, what? Yeah, uh, it's, it's almost the top of the hour. Should we take a break at this time or? Yeah, yeah, wait? we can. If Jay's ready, Jay's the one that's got to, uh, um... there you go. We'll be uh-huh. right. Neil, you there? Hi, yeah, Nancy. Welcome back, everybody. Nancy, did you want to get questions from the chat after after a while, maybe in the last half hour or so? Sure, sure. Okay. Just All right. let me know what they are. Um, okay. I, I guess I would ask people on the chat room to ask the questions in all caps. This way, I'm kind of, this is the first time I'm doing it, so I might miss the questions. So please, if you can, please... Uh, ask the questions in all caps in the last 30 minutes or so. So, uh, Nancy, let's continue with the inner earths for a little bit longer, and then we move on to the next topic. Right. Well, the inner earth thing is the concept yeah. that there is civilizations living inside the earth. Now, if you think about it, you go like, what, you got a ball, and inside the ball is a civilization? It's, it's not like that. What it is is... Instead of the Earth being a complete sphere, a solid sphere, it actually at the at the North Pole begins to. It's almost like you you you. Okay, people who are traveling at the North Pole area in a ship, their compasses go bananas. When they think right. they should be still going north, all of a sudden it's telling them that they're going south. The water there begins to um, become p- without salt. It begins to can become pure water. Now, there are episodes that have been written about of people that continue to continue going south and end up inside the earth. It's almost like this, the skin of the earth folds in. You know, right. so from the concept of somebody who's thinking, who is, who is getting tweaked by this concept of a flat earth, it kind of makes sense. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's not flat like, flat like a, like a, a, a disc. It's a round sphere that, like a piece of paper that, or something, that has a hole in it that actually you can get into the interior oh. of this thing. Mm-hmm. And in the interior is uh, apparently like an artificial sun that allows for, you know, these people to have existed for since before we were here. They have right. interacted with Earth by presenting themselves as gods and from outer space. They don't want Earth surface people to know that they actually live inside the Earth. But on certain occasions, either to try to help humanity um, evolve or to stop humanity from doing something insane, they have come out in order to protect their own, you know, world, which is really the inside of what we think of as our world. But from the flat earthers' perspective, somehow or another, maybe they're flat earthers that are now incarnating as surface people. 
But I, I'll bet you that if you were able to take all these flat earth people and say, let's look at the inner earth, they may realize that all of this angst and all of this, um, this is the truth, this is the truth, you need to hear it, is not because it's a flat earth. It's because it's an earth that is hollow. Mm-hmm. And there's another Agreed. civilization inside it. You agree, Jay? Did, yeah. Jay, uh, 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 did you, are you familiar with the fact that some people actually said that inner earth or Agartha is actually not 3D? It's actually a higher dimensional reality over there. Yeah, they're waiting for us to evolve. Right, okay, yeah. So, it's like for a low frequency person, we wouldn't even know how to get in there, even if we got to the entrance. And it's not automatic that we cannot just automatically enter the inner earth. It's kind probably of- like station, uh, platform nine and three quarters. Uh, in the uh, Harry Potter movie. Uh, <laughs> only, only the magical people, the muggles can't do it, but the magical people right. run towards the wall and they go through it. Right. High, they're higher dimensional. Right. So, okay. Sorry, no. did I just blow your head? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, Jay, Jay and I, Jay and I have, have stumbled into the inner world before because in a past lifetime, I actually went through the doorway into the inner world. And, okay. um, I can remember it in this lifetime. And then we started talking about it and, um, I knew where this was supposed to be in the past lifetime that I saw that. And Does that mean I, you can go back again? I know where the doorway is. Do I think I can go back there? Not unless I'm in, invited. Because you won't see it. When I was there, when I went through it, okay. a guy, a guy right. had actually put their hand on what I saw as a, as a solid wall of stone, put their hand on it, and then the next thing I know, there's a hole there. You know, uh-huh. but what it really happened was that when they put their hand on it, their energy is of higher vibration. It acts like a key, and this um, system picks up their energy sign- signature, and the wall just goes back and then to the side. But th- at the time that this happened, um, which was in the 1886 time frame, that's 1886 time frame, um, that person would be able not be able to even, their brain wouldn't function to see this door do that. All they saw was the guy put the hand on the on the on the stone, right. and the next time, the next thing is a hole. They wouldn't have been uh-huh. able to process the movement of the the stone out of the way. That, that wouldn't even be in their heads. Couldn't possibly. With something. See, our, imagine. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, we're already getting into some kind of interdimensional physics or reality. I mean, it's been like that since you were talking about the UFOs, but what I'm trying to say is, uh, uh, if we, if we could switch gears and talk about, are you familiar with H.P. Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society and the Ascended Masters? Well, yeah. Because, okay. to be honest with you, that when you first started out, you know, decades ago, that was uh-huh. the books you ended up having. I mean, uh-huh. there weren't that many books, and, and you sort of had to learn that stuff or read that stuff. I don't know if you could ever learn it because you can't right. understand it unless you have certain experiences. Right. So what's your take on the Ascendant Masters and her her uh, connection with them? Uh, Well, um, is this, is talk- this a negative? I- yep, sorry. Are you talking Ascended Masters in the concept of the White Brotherhood? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, they, they they have names such as uh, Kutumi or um, Moray or um, uh, Jesus El- or um, uh, K- 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 no, what's his bloody name? Um, Jim El- Jermaine or, uh, um Yeah, all these guys. These are these are familiar. Well, they're familiar to me. I teach the Seven Rays. I don't know if you know that. Uh, well, JP, you have to talk about that now because we want to know about that. What, what do you mean by seven rays? Oh, everybody, everybody who's ever listened to my shows knows that I talk the seven rays. Uh, which, okay. Um, 
which is uh, ba- it's like the same material um, uh, as Blavatsky and and Alice Bailey, right? It's the same source, okay. and uh, and the, law of one, I guess. It's the, it is the law of one and the law of three and the law of four and the law of seven, and how they combine to become the twelve and the law of correspondences and uh, the law of vibration and all that stuff. Um, okay. And I apply oh, it to the monad and the six six bodies, um, and it, uh, my healing seems to work with it. So it, it kind of it all works as a uh, as a as, as a whole to uh, help basically repair angels as you know it's an angel wing repair. Because <laughs> okay. when angels land on the planet, they get damaged. You know, this is a really harsh place to live, and everybody's yes. traumatized. So uh, really, the mission is to kind of. Uh, find the angels and repair their wings, get them back in flight, and uh, you know, like a kind of angel pit stop sort of thing. Anyway, that's that's the idea. Okay. So Does that make sense, angel. or did I just sound like a really whacked out guy? I, no, not at all. I've just been I've just been an island on it. On, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I've just been to Ireland on a on a, on a seven day ayahuasca trip. Or it felt like that. Yeah. It was um, like very, very mind expanding, and, and um, uh, so I'm, I'm speaking with a certain amount of assumption that everybody knows what I'm talking about, um, and that might not be true. So it might just sound crazy. That's uh, that's what I'm just. Uh, no, it doesn't. All right, I good, some, good. I have some knowledge. Yeah. Good, good. Because um, yeah, it, it always helps when uh, when people are talking uh, to know that we're actually in in the same in the same uh, time frame. And so yeah, that. So tell me, what, what's your experience of the uh, of the Blavatsky teachings or the uh, Bailey teachings? Well, I don't really have an experience. I I uh, kind of glimpsed at the material and I read the stories on how she went to India and met these Kutumi, a couple of Ascendant Master guys who, who a lot of people think that this was a fraud and she made made up the whole story, which I did. I don't believe myself. So. My my question here is this uh, this notion of ascended masters, which comes up in uh, Syrian channeling with Sheldon Nidal. Those guys they they have weekly updates on global finances, such as the Nisara or Jisara. Are you familiar with these things? Some kind of Saint Germain fund. I you, you know they, okay the Saint Germain fund. Now that's a really interesting little thing. I don't know very okay. much about it, um, because it's one of these deep, you know, you gotta study these things and look at all the histories and things like that. But the, the right. money even seems to go back as far as like King Solomon and things like that. Uh, yeah. and, and even beyond. Yeah, the gold treasure of all the kings and the, you know, all this stuff. The stuff that all the fairy tales are based on. You know, all the, the right. wars and things like that. But anyway, uh-huh. um, the, uh, the idea of that, uh, Saint Germain, uh, being a real life, um, incarnated master who is like, mm-hmm. basically, look, look, we're talking about extraterrestrials. These people live a long, long time compared to us. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. I was talking with a man called Alex Collier yesterday and he was talking that he spent one of their days on an, an Andromedan ship and it was 33 days long. Wow. So when you think about what we might call an immortal is that mm-hmm. you know they'll come back one year and they'll come back a thousand years later and they don't seem to have aged because our years are so much shorter we're like mayflies right. compared with them you see and that's why we have all these ancient teachings uh because <laughs> we forget things we're like a bunch of goldfish right it's like they walk away they look away they look back and a thousand years has passed and <laughs> and we're stupid again. It must be really yeah. frustrating. It must be like having is it must be like having somebody with Alzheimer's. But try trying exactly. to trying to teach somebody here, how about this? Trying to teach someone with Alzheimer's Alzheimer's how to rebuild a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? yeah well, that's the sort right. of level of civilization concept that we're going to need to understand in order to escape out of our uh, morass that we're right in, because we all need to make choices that are not based on programming that are based on our own heart uh essence and and our heart direction and getting to a point of living in a heart directed life 
is the whole point of what we're doing here on Re- Wall Spirit Radio, certainly. Certainly what I'm doing to bring people into a heart-directed life where, where you don't need a teacher, you don't need a God, because you are connected with all that is. You know, there's no, there's no, nothing outside of you that isn't God. Now, JP, yeah, here ma'am. you touched on a subject that is very, very sensitive. But we still want to cons- uh, proceed with this because the word I want God to is ve- it's a it's a very emotive subject, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, but so I take, think we need take to take a deal breath and it. yeah, take a take yeah. a breath and deal with the emotions because this is the only thing that separates the world, and it's supposed to be the the most goodest thing, isn't it? Right. And yet everybody says, no, my God is different from your God, and my God's better than your God, and my God's going to kick your God's ass. Oh, hang on, that's my brother. Sorry, no, mine. You know, you know what I'm saying? It, it, became, it becomes very personal. <laughs> right. So, right. What, what, how, how do you feel about these things? Um, I actually wanted to ask you one more question about the Ascendant Masters, because... Have you ever followed the Wingmakers material on the web? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, some of the Dr. Neruda interviews, I think it was called, five Dr. Dr. Neruda interviews, where he talks about the Ascendant Masters and the global control, the archonic control of our reality. So there, the Wingmaker material says, if I understood it correctly, is that the dichotomy of good versus evil, right? It's like God versus Lucifer. This dichotomy is actually made up and it's not really, it's two sides of the same coin. So in other words, if you trust the Ascended Masters, they are trying to say they're of the light, they are service to other people, but in actuality, they're just pretending to be that way. They're another part of the control mechanism. So this is all of this Ascended Master and the Love Light and New Age indoctrination is just as bad as the religious indoctrination. How, what do you have? Do you have any take on that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So listen, if you're liable to be programmed, you'll get programmed. But okay. the trick is to be not programmed. You know, so if you, you ever, fr- you know, for, well, if you hang around people who are aware of programming, they'll mm-hmm. bust you on it immediately. You know, they'll point it out straight away. You can see. Right. You can, you can feel it. I tell you, you can, f- if you're a non-program or you've, you, if you've deprogrammed yourself a little bit, uh-huh. just the slightest bit of programming you feel in another person, you'll feel it as a very sharp, edgy, Oh, I feel uncomfortable yes, yes, about that. Yes, yes, absolutely right. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I think a, a lot of people make a mistake at that point of shunning that person. But do you realize that that moment you could serve them by saying, "Do you know what? When you're sitting here, I get this sensation here, and I get, I feel like this, and you know, tell me, is that how you're feeling? Because am I being empathic with you, or am I just kind of talking rubbish? That might start a conversation." that might give them a potential way out of their problems. Okay. So, um, I, I don't embrace shunning anything. I embrace, I, you know, I embrace embracing now. <laughs> it took a while. It's taken a while. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, really, it's about, um, you turn towards it and you take a breath in and see what happens. Um, because we, this is what we're here to do. We're here to heal the world that is presented to us. This is what I'm here to do. And I believe that this is, you know, I'm just an ordinary bloke from London, right? And like, you're a bloke from Bangladesh and Nancy's a yes. girl from, where are you? Kansas? No. <laughs> we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, we're, we're just ordin- ordinary people, not bloodline, not this, not that. At least I don't think so. Okay, JP, since you mentioned the bloodlines, mm. I have a question regarding it. <laughs> what yep. is the, what is the connection with the bloodline and reptilians? Um, essentially the reptilians, uh, try to own as much as they can. Uh, but they realize that human beings are very, very frightened by the look of a reptilian. 
And so um, they tend to uh, manipulate things from behind. And so they've created a series of, uh, of uh, hybrids who are just enough reptilian to um, obey their orders and just enough human to not look too scary to us. I mean, they do look a bit scary. Um, you know, I'll tell you a little funny story that happened in the last few days, and I've got to slip it in because there's nowhere else. I might be able to slip it into Strange Universe tomorrow. But my friend uh, is a plasterer, and he, uh, I'm in northern Scotland here, really near Balmoral, and he was actually working in the garden, in the, um, in the grounds of Balmoral, uh, okay. doing, doing his thing. And uh, he chanced upon Prince Philip himself. The man himself, about, you know, 20 yards away, 20, you know, not very far away, um, and had a small conversation with him. And he saw him as a just kind of, you know, just a regular and, and <laughs> extremely vulnerable old man. And that was it. You know, there was a kind of forgiveness there. Um, okay. And uh, because he's been a, you know, David Icke follower and, and stuff like that. Uh, and okay. So, and, and then not... Th- you know, six hours later, he comes over to my house and I'm producing David Icke on the radio live. <laughs> what a day. <laughs> this is the Thursday was uh, pretty much of a magical day for me. Uh, and, and everybody that I touched, it appears. So, um, yeah. So living the life of an ascended master is what we have to get to, you know, right. to be in the joy of seeing the synchronicity in everything. Uh, is, is just something that is, uh, you, you can't describe easily in words. It would take too long. The only way that poetry uh, could come close to it, you know, or well, poetry is the only way to get close to it. I couldn't even say that, you know. No, nice. But it's a feeling. And it's all about the feeling. Anyway, so, <laughs> ascended masters? Yeah, we're all ascended masters. Here we are. Uh-huh. You know, you're an right. ascended. You've been looking for ascended masters. You may be the master that you're looking for. <laughs> you know, yeah. you check your past lives. You might think, oh, that Yogi Nanda, you know, or oh, that Gautama, oh, all oh, that fellow. You know, you might think, oh, they're so distant from you. They could be right. one of your past lives, or you could be an emanation of one of them. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Same as you were saying, and I just want to chuck a little more thing. One more, one more little yeah. nugget your way is um, you were talking about people and abductions and all of that stuff. I believe that everybody comes from somewhere else, and that our people look after us. So if you are from somewhere else, which you are, because we are, uh-huh. then your people look after you. You might not see them. Beautiful. You might not be aware of them. But it's not abduction. The abduction happens with the military who are trying to find out what these people are doing. Right. That's what the black helicopters are, and that's what all the all the detectors are. The black helicopters have reading instruments on them to try and detect how the heck these people got in and out without their you know radars finding out, and in order to try and improve their radar technologies. Aha. Uh-huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, you got to look at it from the insider's point of view. In the, yes, it's all happening, and they're doing something, right. and they know that they've got, you know, they know they've got uh, hyper-technology, and they're always looking for hyper-technology, to the ways of improving the technology, because they sell it. Apparently, this is this place is, um, this planet and this solar system is a bit like one of these junkyards in, um, in Star Wars, where there's old spaceships and refurbished, uh, um, you know, ah. shuttlecraft and things like that. And... Um, uh, Dick, Dick Cheney and his corporations, they're the people that are kind of making all of this equipment, um, and, uh, selling it to off-planet worlds using slave labor stolen from the earth. Anyway, long story. Dick Cheney, huh? Dick Cheney, yeah. Right. Uh, a bit of a fundamental question for you, JP. Okay, hit it me. Because I'm, I'm stuck at a basic, very basic point. People asking me, how do I know that reptilian beings actually exist? Is there any proof of it? Uh, all over the world, there have been um, depictions of these guys with great big reptilian faces and tails and stuff uh, mm-hmm. in the same mode as uh, what we call Egyptian gods, Anunnaki's. You know, yes. these guys with the funny little kind of pointy, pointy faces and the little pot bellies and the little spindly arms. 
You know, these right. Anunnaki's, right? Um, mm-hmm. And they all carry this thing that looks like a pine cone and a handbag. Yeah, the unk. No, the pine cone. Okay, okay, yes. Yeah, they've yes. got a thing. It looks like a, they're holding a pine cone in their hand. Um, uh-huh. and, uh, there's, and they, they're kind of holding it forwards of, them, of themselves. And then their other hand, they got this little, you know, uh, handbag thing. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen those things. Yeah. yeah. And you got the same creature, uh, the same, uh, devices held by various creatures, including the bird like Thoth and, um, the, uh, the, the Anunnaki and these reptilian looking beings. If you go to a place, mm-hmm. if you look up, uh, Vinca, now, this is very interesting to uh, listeners of the uh, Andronicus papers uh, because uh, the Vincala were the names of the reptilians as called by the Andromedans. And it really, oh, it's okay. a really nice name, Vincala. You know, it really Vincala. kind of, yeah, okay. that's a, they're a scary, I didn't know this. Okay. They're a scary bunch. Well, no, this is, this is from <laughs> a communication that you would not have heard. Um, okay. It's something that is familiar. <laughs> you see, what's really interesting, uh, my friend, is that here we are. You're saying, do ETs exist? Right. Uh, right. And it, it's 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 like, oh, everybody's looking on because in the last four, you know, where is it? Four hours. Uh, the two hours. The show before you, yours was actually mm-hmm. presented by a gentleman uh, who was not born on this planet. Oh, wow. A real E.T. He was shot down in 1972 and held in Area 51. And it's fully documented, and you can see it all over the internet. Um, and he's a presenter here on Wall Spirit Radio. I'm very proud to say, and uh, he's beautiful. He's a beautiful man. Um, okay. And uh, he has aged very, very slowly, like I was saying. Hmm. What's his name again? Audrey Ewis. Audrey Ewis. Okay. So, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, the, we're we're actually building up. Uh, the, there's He's, 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 you know, a few people have like fallen in love with him, which, which is un, unsurprising. Uh, he's, he's got loads of Ray 2. If any, if you know what the Rays are about, he's got loads of Ray 2. He's got three, uh, second Ray soul, second Ray mind, second Ray emotional body. So, wow. uh, okay. it's just, just like, you know, it's just bathing with love, you know, just a bit uh, gorgeous. Anyhow. Awesome. Uh, meanwhile. So, Jay, Jay the, the rays yeah. work with, um, extraterrestrials as well as humanity? He's a human. I thought you said he was born on another planet. Yeah, but he's a human. He's oh, a human that was. Nine born tenths on that? of humanity don't live on planet Earth. More than that. Could you repeat that, JP? Nine tenths of humans don't live on this planet. Could you imagine that? Oh. Let's put the thing, let's put everything in perspective. Not everybody wants to okay. live here. It's a bit like we're in a kind of, you know, like we're in Syria. Who wants to go there? Who's gonna, who's <laughs> gonna emigrate, you know? Right. Okay, so, um, okay. because like, everybody, look, the rest of the universe kind of likes a nice kind of peaceful kind of life, really. You know, very peaceful. How do we people. know this? JP, how do we know this? Uh, because we've spoken to the, the people concerned. Such as who? Well, as in, as in Audrey, as in, um, the Andromedan contactee, Alex Collier, um, people who have spoken oh. to, you know, <laughs> really, you know, uh, you know, we've had them on, on the station and, and I've spoken oh, yes, to them personally. Yes, uh, I've spoken to time way, travelers. JP, how's yeah. Alex Collier now? He's, he uh, okay? he's a lot better. Um, we've got him okay. out of, out of the car. And into a flat, into an apartment, and uh, wow! Finally, okay, yeah, that's good. So that's he's good. had a bit of flu, but uh, he's getting better, and we've had a brilliant, brilliant time. Um, I, just before the show, actually, while while the show was uh, uh, coming, I um, I played uh, Alex Collier's uh, a little piece that he read. Um, okay. Uh, just before we came in. So, hmm. Anyway, meanwhile, is there any very latest update from him? Short brief update from Alex Collier or something interesting. Do you have anything? Well, yeah, that's what, that's what, that's it. I'll give you the link. I'll, I'll put it on YouTube. Okay. Okay. I, cool. I, I've had 1000 views in the last day. Wow. It's uh, really, it's really good. I came for the project. Very good. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is the thing. The, the planet Earth is like, um, it's a bit like a market where everybody comes from all sorts of, all sorts of different places. 
you know. Um, mm-hmm. That's you know that's why we because we didn't come from one African woman eighty thousand years ago. <laughs> what bull? What bull? You know, you can, look. How do you straighten out black hair and turn it into straight white blue hair? You know, and blue blue eyes. You know, There's, you know, we're from uh-huh. we're sort of from. Oh, look, it doesn't make sense. Just look, just take a step back and then you look. Look at America. Earth is like the America of of the world of the of the solar system. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Uh, anyway. Okay. Right. So I'll I'll, I'll step back. Having ex- no, no, no. expanded uh, my I opinions. Think, <laughs> hey, Nancy, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask JP one more question about Corey Good. Dun, dun, Go ahead. Dun. Go ahead. I've I've not spoken to him. But are you? Uh, do you follow his, his no. works? His, no, okay. I, I don't have time to follow anybody. The only way I can like follow anybody is actually to speak with them on the show. I live such a busy <laughs> life. Yeah, to, to actually have contact with people and and um, and uh, have a have an interaction with them. And the shows are different. I like that. You know, it's it's kind of it's different from most interviewers. I I'm not a journalist. I don't go and attack. I'm I'm their friend, and I elicit the them to say the the best things about themselves. That's, that's the way I like yeah. to work. Anyway. Right, that's how it should be. Yeah, that's a better way of doing it. It's all about love. Anyway, um, I'll I'll just step back again um, because uh, you can't have too much fun tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it was great, JP. Thanks for stepping up. Oh well, you really made it more colorful. <laughs> oh, color. Yeah, I'm, I'm very rainbow. Very rainbow. Um, it's, uh, Excellent. It, well, uh, I just want to say, um, we were talking, uh, I, I'm in conversation with a group, um, who are going to be creating what's known as a let's system. Do you know what let's are? No. It's a local money. Do it yourself money. Okay. A barter, it's got a tokenized barter system. Interesting. Does that make sense? Tokenized barter? Yeah. So that's what we're doing, and that's what we're going to do for the world. We're going to create a system of money that has no debt, that is credit-based, and we're going to make everybody happy because everybody will have abundance. Is this, are we going to reinvent the wheel, or we're going to just... We're going to throw some- away the square wheels... And we're going to make <laughs> okay. round wheels for the people. Uh-huh. We've had square wheels. We had to work far too hard. You see, yeah. here's the thing: a debt is a doubt. Yeah, I see. You've, you've, you know, there's a bit of you that isn't whole. Uh, right. And debt is like a death too. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. So it's all, it's all. It, that's all got to stop. And it's credit based, which is Ubuntu based, which is pay it forward, which is I do something for you, and then you yeah. give me some some token for it. And then I can, uh, you know, somebody can do something, and then I get, you know, it's, it's a, uh, oh, wow, how can I say? It? It's, it's credit based. It's based on the credit of someone rather than the debit of somebody. And that, that tiny, tiny, tiny little adjustment in concept produces the opposite of the negative spiral of the, uh, of the debt based system. Imagine, you know, the debt based system has a limit. And we've hit it. This is it. You know, this is what oh, we're yeah. looking at in the world. Right? But the credit based system has no limit. You just keep on going. Because, Wonderful. You know, the, the energy doesn't get drained because it's, there aren't, all right, so, all right, Mike, <laughs> you ask me. All right. <laughs> you, you ask me on your show. Anyway, if you have a, uh, uh, we, we, myself and, and Stuart Noble in, in Scotland, we we experimented with various uh, different systems, and uh, we came up with one, and uh, we spread it around. And it got installed in various places and various local places, and we discovered that there were some some um, some systems were, that when they you know they were trying to uh, get a whole bunch of people with mental health problems to um, to kind of uh, you know form communities and things like that. But of course, you need sane people that, to run one of these things. But they let the they let the you know. Anyway, so uh, what they did is exactly what the human brain does. They created a pile of denial. They created an account that whenever uh-huh. the system went out of balance, they would balance the account from that. And it went further and further and further into debt on a secret uh-huh. account. 
it was fascinating to watch because that's exactly what the earth does that's exactly what um you know crazy people do <laughs> that's why <laughs> because okay. that's why you don't want crazy people running your money system exactly right and crazy yeah. people have a pile of denial and a whole bunch of secrets totally nancy well it takes crazy people to want to run a that kind of a thing. Why would you want to bother with it? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so the whole, the whole thing's run by crazy people. You yeah. must be, be crooked. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be. They can't, they can't, if you, if they haven't got anything on you, they don't want you because they can't pop at you. Oh god. The whole thing is sick. The whole thing needs to just collapse. And <laughs> we don't, we don't need them. We don't, we, we, you know, we need administration. We don't need government. That's all. Uh, you know, I'm there not is, saying, yeah, I'm there's not quite a, go ahead. I'm sorry. There's a, there's a whole bunch of us now that understand that the problem, right? The conspiracy and the system needs to change. However, there's still a huge majority of people who aren't quite on the same page with some of us. So how does this switch over happen? Does it happen gradually over many years or is, is there going to be some kind of an event like Cobra says? Or is something's gonna break? And my friend, just gonna be, my friend, yeah. you're in it. It's today. It's this week. It's happening now. Okay. You're in it. You're part of it. Welcome. Right. You know, really. So we're making it happen. Right? Really? Yes, yeah. It's whatever you're doing, whatever your intention. That's what mm -hmm. makes it happen. However far and hard you push that intention to make some change in the world, like put on a little event saying, "Do ETs live among us?" Are they friendly? You know, stuff like that, little events mm -hmm. that you could put on, and then people might start coming forward and says, oh, you know, I've had dreams of living on another planet. Really? Oh, what kind of planet? Oh, what do people look like? You know. And you may find that some of the best friends that you have have been uh -huh. ETs for years, much like Ford Prefect. Correct, right. That's how I feel. You know? And I feel so guided and, like, taken care of. It's It's amazing. And protect it as well. See, Neil, one of the reasons that I wanted, you know, I, I actually pushed you to do this show mm -hmm. was because I believe that the radio shows, um, particularly the ones on Wolf Spirit, uh, okay, I'm prejudiced, um, <laughs> are feeding, are feeding the, uh, collective unconscious. Every time we get up and we schedule a show and we actually carry it off, we have talked and we have our thoughts are now in the collective consciousness. The people right. that listen live in the collective consciousness, the ones that listen on tape in the collective consciousness. And sooner or later, the images that we're putting up there are going to be the dominant images. And everybody right. will just start waking up because that's what they're getting fed. The reason the matrix works is because everybody believes in it. The way, the reason the banking system works is because everybody believes in it. But if nobody right. believes in it, it changes. And it doesn't have to be, you know, Armageddon changing. It's just like, oh, well, that's stupid. Why are we doing that? I don't know. Let's not do it anymore. Excellent. So this conversation we're having on this show, this is changing the morphogenetic field of humanity, I guess, right? Is that how? Correct. Exactly. Right. So exactly. Even though it sounds like just uh, three of us just talking about our lives He's blathering away, you know, on our path of knowledge. But essentially, we're we're actually changing the verbiage that's in people's minds and putting in concepts that are that are the of higher vibration, even though they have not physically heard it. Correct. Right. That's the the concept of of what we do here is that we make schedules so that we can have these conversations to feel mm -hmm. the collective consciousness. If we, you know, how, I mean, how many of these type of conversations do you have on a daily basis? Never. Right. That's why we have, right. that, you know, that's, that's why these shows and shows like them are so critically important. Um, is for instance, okay, there is the, the reality of the Armageddon, okay? Then you've got the reality of what I call the, the goody two-shoes, where everybody goes into a state of light and enlightenment and da-da-da, I don't know, you send. Oh, that's the word, you send. 
I believe that, um, first off, that the 3D experience is awesome. Okay? It's got a lot of dirt okay. and negative stuff to it, but it, when you look at the beauty of it, the, the variety of life, the way yeah. that you interact with it, I don't want to walk away from that. Exactly. I would rather I would rather evolve as a person who lives in a biosphere called Earth to a point where we can get rid of all the things that we don't like and keep all right. the things we do like, like a middle ground type of reality. Exactly. So, I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So as we Walt, Silva and myself on our radio programs and, and like I've got like I don't know, three radio programs a week plus many times a fourth one and often I'm on somebody else's. So I make a point of going out there and talking to people because for the time that they are listening to me talk about a new reality, they're mm-hmm. not thinking about the old reality and that thought process of not thinking is taking energy out of that old one. The more people Absolutely. that will just, you know, begin to consider an alternative reality you get less and less energy in the old reality so that old reality doesn't have to be fixed it just has to have the energy that is fueling it put into building a new reality and it will just fizzle out on its own no drama yeah exactly exactly so what's next we have about 20 minutes left. Is there uh, any questions in the chat room? Uh, if you have any questions in the chat room, please put it in upper case. That would be, I think, more easily identifiable. So, um, now your friends. Say, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, go I'm ahead. Just- I'm just wondering about um, the people that are in Bangladesh with you or the people that you interface with on Facebook. Are you finding that um, whereas you can't talk to your to your family or friends in Bangladesh, that you do have uh, quite a number of people in Facebook that are on the same path as you or a similar path? Yeah, they're, I'm getting more and more people actually following what I'm saying, but... All this time, it hasn't been like this. The, I didn't have a big audience at all. But now it seems like it's changing. People would pay attention and And that, that's absolutely bit. true. The people are changing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people who never would consider, um, consider that the banking thing is all a delusion, you know, are now right. talking in terms of you can't trust the banks. It's all delusion. They know it. So that, see, that's kind of what I think that we have going for us is that in the last analysis, because of the schematic of so as above, so below, everybody really does know the truth. It's just a matter of having a story to explain that truth. We have a caller. Okay. Who's the caller? Yeah. This this is Patrick from uh, California. Hi, Patrick. Hello, hello. Um, I was listening into the radio station. Uh, I understand we have limited time, but um, you were talking about the different realities that are coming forth at this moment, correct? Different realities, did you say? Well, so the levels at which um, certain realities are going to manifest themselves. Yes, yes, okay. Um, so I was listening, and I just felt the need to call in. So I'm part of an organization that is currently working on, it, it's a three-tier um, kind of, it's a three-tier system. You have the celestial, terrestrial, and terrestrial, um, and those wow. are the three that my organization is currently working on. Wow, okay. What's the name of your organization, please? Um, for right now, I will go ahead and um, you could probably, I'll, I'll use, um, it's the Eternal Family. Okay. Eternal family, right? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, that is correct. Are they connected with the Joseph Smith teachings? What was that? Are they connected to the Joseph Smith teachings? Yes, they are connected to that. I thought so. I recognized the language, yes. Okay. 
So, um, well, since you brought that up, um, there's a lot of framework that's, um, that's being used as a fundamental media. And so that's just one of the organizations that I am tied to because of the three tiers of reality. Um, so basically, yeah. So just to expand, what I do is I, I find certain organizations that have these little nuggets of um, truth, if you will, and um, I focus on those. And uh, so I don't consider myself, a, you know, a full, full member, but I am a part of that organization because of the nuggets that they hold. Okay. So uh, do, you have, do you have a question you'd like to put across? No, no, no. I just wanted to put that forth. Um, I didn't, I didn't mean to, um, interrupt, if you will, but, um, no, I've been a, a listener for, for quite some time. And, um, this was just the first time that I caught a live show and wanted to, um, put in that little piece of information. Okay. Uh, what's, what's your name again? And do you have, do you have a handle in the chat room? Um, uh, Year Ender. That's what I've used before. Year Ender. Okay. Thank you, Year Ender. Year Ender. Um, and uh if if there's no more we we uh we want to bring the uh, show to a nice close so uh uh thank you for calling good night well thank thank you for having me on uh, yes, Neil. over to you neil j p i think i i got a question for nancy from uh vanessa a a m vanessa a m do you think you didn't really want to delve into things like betty barbie because you had close encounters that you didn't consciously remember, but you were very uncomfortable when ob objections came out to the public. I'm like sorry, can you read that again? <laughs> I'm sorry, I did a bad job read. Do you think you didn't really want to delve into the things like Betty and Barbie because you had close encounters that you didn't consciously remember, but you I were understand very... What you, yeah, I understand what you, It's, um... Betty and Barney. Barney Betty and Barney, Barney Hill, isn't oh, it? Barney. Okay, yeah. No, Hill. Right. Hill, right. I said White. White. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because Betty White. That's you know. Yeah, I know. Um, I know. <laughs> I do that. Uh, yeah, aluminium. That's all I can say. Aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Aluminium. I don't know that it was. No, I never. I've never felt. I've never had an indication that um, that I felt like I was abducted. I've never had any of that. Um, I just think that I didn't, it indicated to me, if you put a human being in that kind of a stressful situation, regardless of what your reasoning is, to me it was unkind. It was not something that intuitively I would feel comfortable with, with a pe group of people that I considered kind people, the ETs that I had interfaced with. So to me, all of a sudden, it brought up the concept of is there an evil ET out there using us, abusing us? And that, um, to me, was not, I didn't feel comfortable with that thought. Even though I thought it could be true, I still didn't want to put my energy into it. So it wasn't like I felt like I'd ever been abducted. I, I have been abducted, <laughs> I guess. Um, I remember it. I remember it. So, you know. Um, it wasn't, it was, it was, and it wasn't a, it was an abduction by the people that I believe are kind. And they basically, when I was three years old, they took me right out of my grandmother's arms aboard their ship. And then they, um, did something with my third eye so that it could never be, uh, closed down. Uh, they put some kind of a, a protection thing in there. I've always been connected. I've never not been connected. I remembered all, not all my past lives, but I remember past lives. Um, so, uh, and they also um, wanted to create what they called an impact point. And an impact point is the fact that I was on, a, on an ET ship. I was talking to, um, uh, well, who you would know as St. Germain, um, that he was taking me as a three-year-old. Uh, through his ship talking to me as if I was an adult. I wow. am suspicious that at that moment perhaps there had been an exchange or, uh, I see at that time particularly there, they, they did know, they were able, they, they were able to determine that certain people, um, were different, that something was happening. 
And so they financed it, and this is more of your reptilian uh, level group, not not Kabbalah, but the ones above them. And they okay. were able to finesse the science enough to realize that if they got a certain image in a in a woman that was pregnant, that that child was probably one of these dang rainbow warriors or whatever you want to call them. So uh-huh. they were causing um, problems with miscarriages at that time. And so they, the powers, you know, the good guys, they set it up so that you would, would start up a uh, pregnancy with sort of like a, um, it's kind of like the person who is going to come in that will change the signature of the mom is not sent in in the first, you know, even after birth. Uh, another soul is sent in to hold the space for this other. Wow. Okay, so that when okay. the when the when the child became got to a certain point, then there would be this ex- exchange. It's so it's sort of like a walk in situation. I see. Uh, but only because they had to. That was the only way they could get the Rainbow Warrior Warriors through the uh, through the muck. It was what we call and, going freelance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll meet yeah. you on Wolf Spirit Radio, That's 2016, about- just about September. See we see you yeah. there. That's about the way that it all works out, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so uh, what was your question, though? I'm, I think I strayed from it. Um, I think we can move on. I just, in the last ten minutes, I wanted y- your take on Corey Good and David Wilcox's situation. Well, I, I for one, believe that um, Corey Good believes he's telling the truth. Right. I I believe that um, what he's saying, for the most part, is true. But I don't trust any given story. I don't trust my own story. Right. <laughs> you know, there's many times I'll tell yeah. something and say, well, I might be making it up. You know, because it's just part and parcel of how everything is. So, uh, you know, it's discernment. It's like I look at Corey and I listen to the message. Not so much. To me, he's real. I don't know what this Facebook thing is doing. To me, he is real, um, mm-hmm. and the information that he's giving is real. So when he tells something, I can only assume that it is probably real. I can't be certain that it is real because I don't exactly know where he is at that moment because he's had his brain so mucked with. Right, right. That um, he could be getting messages that he thinks are real but aren't. So, uh, and that's true with anybody. It's not just Corey Good, you know. Um, right. David Wilcock, I have an extreme amount of respect for because he is just an awesome researcher. He takes divergent subjects, blows them around in his head, and then comes out with a, oh, I think it looks like this. So, right. and he's also been burned so many times. I've been a follower of his for many years. And he's been burned so many times that he is ultra cautious. And if he says that he believes Corey Good is is the real deal, then I'm going to um, say, okay, all right, for now he's the real deal. Let's let's play it as if he is. <laughs> uh, Nancy, a friend of mine, uh, she's on chat. She's asking the same question many times. I'm, I don't know if she's joking or not. She wants to know if Mer- uh, Michael Jackson was murdered by. The reptilians. <laughs> That's her question. Would you like to take that? Well, in some timeline, maybe. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Okay. That, see, that's that's the thing you, that people really have to to kind of get to grips with, is that there's right. nothing you can do about the. You can't predict the future. You can create the future, but you can't predict the future. And you're only right. predict. You're only creating one future. There are many, many futures. Every time anybody makes a decision. They create a timeline. It starts up automatically. Now, if you go to the right instead of the left, then there's no energy fueling the left side, so it just peters out. All right. So any, like, it's like, oh, is Hillary Clinton dead or alive? She's dead and alive. It goes back to the cat in the box thing. Anything uh-huh. and everything is possible. You know, right. it's like, um, okay, the question is, 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 is she alive? Well, I'm a, I claim to be a remote viewer. Can I go and find out if she's alive? No, because I don't know which timeline I la- I'd end up on. Aha. Uh-huh. How interesting. You know, you have to, yeah. to, to get accurate information, you really have to be very, 
um, conscious of what what's the anchor, where are you going, what's drawing you in. And in the case of Hillary Clinton, it's 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 a Hillary Clinton. I don't have any connection to her, so it could be on any timeline. Um, right. Once you understand the the fluidity of life, then you realize, and there's nothing much you can do about the past according to what people think. If you live in the present and you make a change in the present, you can change the past. It's as malleable as the future is. The only thing right. that's stable is the present. And right. if people learn to live in the present, then they are in a point of power. Right. And, and that's a child. And at that point, at this point of power, I think we should uh, draw it to a close. All right, JP. Do you have a so, website, Neil? Yeah, I, I, my website is, it's a blog. It's Neil Baul, N-E-O-B-A-U-L, dot blogspot, dot com. Nancy, you want to give yours? A cosmic reality dot net. And I, th I thank you so much, uh, Neil. I, I'm, now, just so people understand, um, this is the ODD Collective Show. Neil is going to be taking um, the fourth Sunday, hopefully, every other Sunday. Uh, next next month, it'll be um, the Shungite's show. We're going to do a show on Shungite with uh, Stephanie uh, Dietz. And um, this is listener-supported. So anybody out there, you can go over to Wolf Spirit. You can donate directly to Wolf Spirit. You can also become a member and then for $5 a month get the uh, be able to download any and all of the archives that go back many years. For those of you that are hearing this now and think, maybe I want to listen to it or have a copy of it, you can go to the current archives on wolfspiritradio.com and you can download any of the shows for a week after. Um, thank you very much, Neil. Jay? Arr, well, I suppose to do this voice right now because it's the end of the show, so uh, we're going to do it my way. All right, especially for you, Tracy. <laughs> she wanted the pirate. Thank you for she wanted the pirate voice. I gave her the pirate voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> she wasn't there. Bye. Alrighty. <laughs> bye bye everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.